Now what will it be? Death or exile? Welcome everybody to our fourth episode of In The Spotlight, where we will shine a light on the home theatre experience. Whilst televisions have been commercially available since the 1930s, the last 30 to 40 years of history has seen the home theatre experience in a constant state of transition. We've gone from the curved cathode ray tubes and Betamax to semi-curved Trinitron TVs and VHS. We've gone from flat screen tubes and DVDs to flat widescreen plasmas and televisions with Blu-ray. The most recent jump in the home theatre experience is one that I have just recently experienced and that is the jump to crystal clear 4K. While I appreciate many of you will have had 4K televisions for a while now, as a new incumbent to this society of the visually privileged, I was faced with a lot of questions. Luckily, I have a few friends who I consider experts in the field of home cinema to guide me through the process of finding my first affordable 4K TV. And I'd like to introduce them to you now. First of all, my dear friend and fellow film exile, who was really helpful when I chose my new 4K TV. Great. Ah, good evening, good morning, good day, <laughs> good night. <laughs> good God, good meat, good Lord, let's eat. <laughs> and also my fellow film exile, who you'll know from his great Watchmen review series, Brandon. Hey, good to be here. <laughs> Good to have you both. So, Gray, why don't we kick it off with what 4K is? And okay. is it actually 4K? Well, that's kind of the weird thing. Uh, 4K refers to, or the, the term 4K refers to uh, the number of pixels in a screen. We call it, when it comes to home theater, we call it UHD, which is ultra high definition. And the reason we call it UHD is because a 4K TV is not actually 4K in resolution. The 4K resolution, if we're talking the DCI digital cinema system, which if you go to a movie theater, that's what you're going to see. They use a DCI system. The um, pixel density in there is a 4096 by 2160. So that's 4096 pixels wide by 2160 pixels tall so that's 4k what we call 4k for um, television or what's known as uhd is actually only 3840 by 2160 and this isn't something that's new we did the same thing with 2k also Mm -hmm. Um, um, 2k resolution for um, movies is actually just a tiny bit uh, wider than 2K resolution or what we call uh, HD for television screens. So it's not exactly really true 4K. It's close enough to it. And the reason that they do it is because um, we are. it's easier to produce TVs consistently at different uh, resolutions mm-hmm. if you uh, make them a 16 by 9 format. So yeah. you know, for every one block of every one block high it's so many wide whatever um so you shave off a few pixels off the side you get that perfect rectangle format and everything kind of fits in there because you force the image to kind of squash down a little bit and fit in there you don't lose any image but Mm -hmm. it's not exactly not exactly the full resolution yeah because uh, i think it refers to the usually when we were talking about televisions back in hd ready and um full hd we're talking about the number of pixels vertically right so you your hd ready was was 720p your full hd was 1080p and now what are known as the 4k televisions are actually 2160 so for some reason they've gone instead of referring to the the number of vertical pixels they now appear to be referring to the number of horizontal pixels right it's a little bit like that yeah so they're they're cheating a little bit it should be called 2k really shouldn't it (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> well, like the, well, a lot of people point out that 2K was never really full 2K, and we kind of mm-hmm. skipped over 3K. And yeah, 2K is other... essentially 1440p. Yeah, we'll get to which is what a lot of phones are now. Yeah. So, so what is a pixel, Brandon? <laughs> Let's get to the science of it. <laughs> the science is really simple. A pixel is is a single dot on the screen. Mm-hmm. The more the more dots you have, the the higher the resolution, and the the sharper the image tends to be. Uh, obviously, that depends on the on the source of the image, but uh, the more individual tiny little pixels, the the more data you can hold, and the the cleaner and the the clearer your picture ends up being. Uh, when you go to a, a lower resolution picture on a bigger screen, uh, you have less pixels. Therefore, uh, each pixel looks bigger as, as you get bigger in screen size. And and we were we were talking about this kind of yesterday, weren't we? We were saying that a smaller 4K television, so a 43 inch 4K television, has a higher um, pixel density than a 60 inch, for example. Yes. So the when you're when you're talking 4K or UHD, every UHD TV has the same number of pixels, mm-hmm. except in small technology differences where you've got one pixel that's made up of four individual micropixels, things like that. That's all tech jargon. But essentially, a 43 inch TV and a 75 inch TV, if they're both 4K, they both have the same number of pixels. Uh, so, the smaller that you get on a TV, the less noticeable the resolution is mm-hmm. because it's condensing those pixels so tight in together uh, that you just you don't notice it as much. The bigger the TV you go, the more important it is to have a higher resolution so you don't get any loss in image quality. Okay, so something for someone who's who's in the market for a 4K TV to to consider, really, isn't it? I mean, how far away are you going to sit from the television? Are you going to notice the pixels if it's on a bigger screen or a smaller screen? Yeah. Uh, essentially, yeah, but, I mean, even now then, I, I paid less than $300 for a 43-inch Samsung for my bedroom. Mm-hmm. Like, it's... The, the cost difference, I mean, can you even get a 1080p TV for for much cheaper than that anymore? You just might as well go 4K and get HDR. Uh, because, yeah, the, it, 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 the cost and, and the availability of 1080p is just going away. 4K is just that cheap to produce now. Well, there are some caveats within that, though, when you start to get into the... Uh, lesser expensive 4K TVs or the UHD TVs and this is where we start to get into some of the uh, dickery pokery some of the trickery Mm -hmm. uh, the marketing trickery because really when in in order to be certified and this was something that that just kind of came up uh, um, a couple years ago that the um, manufacturing industry kind of um, browbeat the certification boards into when, when you're talking about um, UHD, there's a certification process that goes on with it. You know, you have to get in order to be um, able to use the UHD and the Full HD and all the, the marketing indicia that's become standardized, you have to go through a certification process, you have to get a certificate for your, for your screen, and then you can put all the logos and everything on there that say that you're a real thing. And all that's really doing is counting the number of pixels that are in the in the panel and that mm-hmm. makes sense right you, know, yeah. you say okay we've got 28 whatever by 20 or 40 96 by 2160 pixels in the screen that's fine in order to meet some of the cost demands what some manufacturers do is they use pixels that um every fourth pixel is a is a white pixel and let me explain the way this works the general technology that everybody kind of understands, even if they don't know they understand it, um, when we're talking about how images are put together with screens, computer monitors, and, and things like that, um, we're talking about um, RGB elements, red, green, blue elements. You combine red, green, and blue together in different quantities, and you can make pretty much whatever color there is that exists. Right. And that's how every LCD panel or TV or – that's how they all work. They all do the same thing. A, a true full UHD screen, each pixel will be made up of three sub-pixels. That'll be a red one, a green one, and a blue one, and that's it. 
that's all they that's all they use in order to create the create the colors. And then you have um, a back right now. We're starting to get into some of the technical stuff. Um, so you'll have the panel that's got the that's got the pixel elements, and then behind that you'll have a backlight that shines through there, and that's what actually creates the illumination and lets mm-hmm. you, lets you see the screen. The backlight has to you know a UHD. Uh, especially ones that are going to use uh, HDR, which we'll talk about a little later, they have to be able to achieve a certain brightness, um, which in the industry is measured in logs or it's measured in nits. So it has to be able to achieve a certain brightness in order to be considered for HDR. So you have a very bright backlight. Uh, They use LED backlights now. Those illuminate the pixels, allows you to see the image. What some TV manufacturers have done Um, in order to get the cost down on the screens is instead of using uh, the three um, micropixel RGB pixels Mm -hmm. and a brighter backlight, in order to achieve the brightness that they want, they will use a four subpixel system. That's a red, a green, a blue, and a white subpixel. Uh, So they're cheating. Yeah, they'll combine the white pixel with a lower brightness backlight to achieve a kind of um, the appearance of a brighter image. Mm-hmm. But they're still doing that within the same pixel ratio. It's still the 4096 by 2160. They're not right. adding in an extra pixel. What they're doing is they are removing or occupying a pixel that could have been used for actually generating image. Mm -hmm. and substituting a white pixel in there. If you were to go through and remove each white pixel, you would actually be shrinking the number of pixels that are in the screen. You'd actually be reducing the resolution of it. So a lot of the lower price, not all of them, um, but a lot of the lower price screens that use this four sub-pixel system, they are technically UHD screens by raw number, but they do not achieve the same image resolution as a full UHD screen does. It's just a little bit less. Most people won't notice, and a lot of those um, panels go into smaller screens, which is why it's so easy to kind of uh, miss over it. But it is something to be aware of when you're out there shopping around. And it's not information that's real easy to find. Um, I've been able to find it a lot on a the website uh, – Ratings.com, ratings.com. Uh, they will usually have a, a good close-up image of the subpixel system in each screen, so you can kind of take a look at it and look at the price and look at all the things and kind of go, okay, does this seem like a, a, it'll be a good enough trade-off depending on what your application is. Oh, that's really, really good information, man. Yep. Um, Brandon, we've heard Gray mention something called HDR. Can you tell people a little bit about what HDR is and maybe touch upon things like Dolby Vision? Um, Yeah, so absolutely. HDR for me is actually probably more important than even 4K. It's, It's high dynamic range, so it's it's brighter whites. It's a, it's a, the ability to achieve brighter whites, blacker blacks. And when you achieve both of those, you can also achieve richer colors throughout the spectrum. So everything that you see is more truly accurate to how the filmmakers are designing it when they're doing their color grading and when they're doing visual effects. It is just it's a more rich image. So it's, it's it has nothing to do with the sharpness like 4k does. Okay. It has everything to do with the, the actual visual feel of, of the image. Right. And I've heard the term Dolby vision bandied around. Is that anything similar to, to HDR? Yes. So Dolby vision is like buying a car that has a souped up motor. So, <laughs> when you, you you have a base model car, it, it's got everything you need in it, but there's one version right above it that's got a turbocharger. <laughs> that's that's what Dolby Vision is. It's it's the same basic idea. It's just more power. It's got more raw data. It achieves a higher bit rate, and again, just richer colors, much deeper blacks, brighter I, whites. You mind if I jump in here with a little bit of a? 
There's a little bit of techno mumbo jumbo. A little, a little bit more technically <laughs> advanced. Let's hear it. Than than a turbocharged engine. <laughs> All right. So so HDR. It, it it like like Brandon said. It's it's about dynamic range. Dynamic range is the difference between your brightest white and your darkest black on the screen. Mm-hmm. If you can increase the dynamic range in something, in a color, because um, all colors eventually will, you, you make them dark enough, they'll turn black. You make them bright enough, they'll turn white. That's your dynamic range. And in between those, you have every step in between. And every step in between in the brightness allows you to mix those colors in order to achieve a slightly so, different tone. So is that why when I watch Man of Steel on my 1080p television and when I watch it on my 4K television, the reds on my 4K television feel more red, more saturated, That's... and the blues are a little bit more saturated than what I'm used to when watching it on my 1080p television, for example? That's a part of it. Uh, some of that is part of the basic difference between... Um, HD and UHD. Okay. Um, when we're talking about display technology, there is a thing called color space. And it's literally what it sounds like. Um, if theatrical releases, for, let's say for the last 20 years, any digital movie release, um, they've been working in a color space called DCI P3, digital cinema. Um, I can't remember, digital, digital cinema interchange or something like that. I don't remember exactly what it is. But the color space they use is P3. And that basically is a, a imagine a, a triangle. Red on one point, green on another point, and blue on another point. The size of that triangle is all of the colors that DCI P3 can, can produce. And that's pretty much been considered almost as good as analog. You know, that is almost as good as film. It's It's... It's got a good wide range of colors and a big spectrum of dynamic range. The HD system that we're all used to uses, most commonly, it uses a color space called REC 709, REC 709. And these are all just basic different terms that, that mean the same thing, but they designate different sizes. So if DCI P3 is this huge big triangle of color, REC 709 is a smaller triangle laid over top of it it doesn't quite grab as many colors it doesn't cover as many colors as dci p3 and it's one of the trade-offs that kind of gets made in order to be able to compress things down and uh, have a deliverable format for blu-rays and for streaming on netflix and amazon prime and all the different tv systems get to uhd now have a new color space, which is called um, REC 2020, REC 2020. Now, REC 2020 is technically bigger than DCI P3. So what that means is if you're taking a movie that was finished for DCI P3, regular digital cinema, yeah, you can take the full color information from that and just dump it right in a REC 2020 shell, and you will see everything that was originally in that. As it was intended. As it was intended to be. Right. That's the first reason why you have things where when you move from HD to UHD, Mm -hmm. the images look significantly different. So so when somebody moans about Man of Steel being so dull and drab and monotone. Really, what they're doing is complaining that they've got a rubbish television. Well, it's not just, it's not just <laughs> that. It's, it, again, you have to, when you're mastering things down from DCI-P3, from the digital cinema master, the 2K master, and transferring that down to HD, you have to make a compromise somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're giving up some amount of dynamic range and you're giving up some amount of color and what you're doing is you're just you're just trying to say what is it that we can give that will still allow us a balance of what was intended to be seen um versus being able to get it into this deliverable package so so you have to look at and say okay we're gonna have to slice off you know a chunk of colors you know uh uh rec 709 the hd color space doesn't 
uh, quite have as much uh, red, and it kind of fails a little bit more in the blue area. So everything kind of tends more towards green. So you have to kind of make a choice. We either just hack off these pieces of you know, the color spectrum and just deal with it as it is. It's mm-hmm. going to be a little more greenish. Or we have to, to try and maneuver the color balance around to find some space in the middle that looks pretty good. But you're going to cool. lose you're going to lose brightness too because you're losing dynamic range. And that also comes into play depending on on what format you're watching. If you're watching something on cable, even more of that is stripped away because yep. they just have they have less bandwidth, they have and less they resolution, the they can't per- they have to compress it down, they can't get all the colors. So yeah, if if somebody's saying, yeah, the you know the Man of Steel suit looks gray almost, it's well because you're watching it on t- on TNT, <laughs> and it's not supposed to look like that. But basically, if you watch it on a copy, yeah, a, a, pretty much. Yeah, it, it's almost yeah, just stripping all the color away, stripping all the resolution away, and giving you just the the basic idea of what you're supposed to see. And then when you hit Blu-ray, you're getting a, a much better image of that because you have as much as on physical media as possible in a controlled format. And then when you hit UHD 4K discs, it's all there, exactly yep. the way it was meant to be seen. They don't have to compromise. Now we start to get into um, HDR. HDR is additional to the color space. HDR is... A, a path that that extends the dynamic range of the colors that are available. So now instead of having, I'm throwing out an arbitrary number, instead of having a hundred steps of, you know, a hundred different shades of a color between black and white, now suddenly you have 10,000 shades of a color between black and and, and has I, this got anything to do with the different types of HDR seed labeled? Because I've seen HDR, HDR10. What the? What are those? What are those? Uh, that's that is in in simple terms. <laughs> there's a lot there's of three. Yeah, there's there's three main HDR technologies. Well, four, but there's three that mainly get that you will mainly hear about. That's HDR10, HDR10 plus, and Dolby Vision. Okay. Um, the difference between them is HDR. They all refer to how the system, your total display system, deals with the maximum and minimum brightness of the image that it's being fed. Um, so, basic HDR. What they do is they they look at the information that's coming through, they look at the image data and they set a maximum brightness for it. Mm -hmm. And that is it. Either your TV can display at that brightness, in which case you're going to get all of the brightness that's programmed into the image or your TV can't display all that brightness. Say the images, the, the disc is in, is mastered at a thousand nits of brightness, which, you know, Let's think of think of a, a knit as a marble. So you've got a thousand knits. You've got a thousand marbles in the image. Well, your TV is a jar that can only hold eight hundred marbles. Mm. So at some point, something's got to happen. You either have a bunch of marbles that you can't put in there, in which case your TV hits a certain brightness at that point in the image, and then yeah, it maxes out. Everything just turns white. And when that happens, you lose any amount of image detail that was left in those last 200 marbles is gone. Okay. So what TVs can do is they can, they can compensate for that by changing the brightness of the image. They can lower the overall brightness of the image to avoid that from happening, but you're making it less, making the image less bright. Right. And the reason that the TVs have to do that is because the program material has the one brightness programmed into it and that's it that's mm-hmm. all it can do so that's your regular hdr when you get into hdr or your hdr 10 when you get into hdr 10 plus and dolby vision two different ways of doing basically the same thing where they go through the 
data for the image, and instead of just saying the entire movie is 1,000 nits of brightness, and that is all there is to it, they can now communicate with the TV to maximize the brightness for each individual scene that comes through. It's a dynamic system uh, I see. as opposed to a static system. So Dolby Vision is, is constantly talking to your TV, and it's going, okay, um, this scene here, it's, uh, the overall brightness of the scene is 1,000 nits, and you've got a 900-nit TV, so we're going to lower that. But the overall brightness of this next scene is only 600, so we're going to take that. It will raise the brightness to 900, so this way you get a consistent brightness and that's an active system. And HDR 10 plus does the same thing. There's also some, there's some differences in, in how the two systems deal with um, color and things like that. But that's not really, that's not really as, in, as important as that brightness issue. It makes the difference between the two of them. So for someone who wants the best image possible, you, are, you would advise someone to get something with Dolby Vision. If if HDR10 Plus isn't an option, mm-hmm. um, which unfortunately we do have a format war going on, so <laughs> flashbacks to VHS uh, versus Betamax hot sweats. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are some TV manufacturers that support HDR10 Plus and don't support Dolby Vision. There are some that support Dolby Vision, don't support HDR10 Plus, and there's there are very few that that support both of them. You really kind of have to. It's, it's, I don't want to make it sound like it's a matter of one being better than another, even though from a technical standpoint, Dolby Vision is superior. Yeah. From a practicality standpoint, though, what you're actually going to notice, they're more or less the same. So it okay. really comes down to what TV do you want and yeah. what material you want. Because yeah. if you get something that's, that's, if you get a movie that's in Dolby Vision, there's a probably a pretty good chance that it's not going to be an HDR 10 plus also. Right. You can watch a Dolby Vision movie or watch Dolby Vision programming on a TV that doesn't support Dolby Vision. All it does is it just takes away the dynamic aspect of it and just renders it out as okay. regular HDR 10. All right, but, but by and large, you're not going to gonna see much of a difference um as a general it's kind of messy because if it's also got it has to be on the disc so mm-hmm. many manufacturers of the, the the studios might not put dolby vision on the disc but they will put hdr uh right. which i mean pretty much every 4k movie has hdr not all of them but basically yeah uh, right. but i'd say what 10 percent of 4k uhd discs have dolby vision uh, uh, it's, it's difficult to say at this point. The big difference is, and this is the thing that makes the really, really big difference, Dolby Vision costs. There's a licensing fee. Yeah, and that's... HDR10 and HDR10+, Plus. that's an open source system. That's free. Right. But a couple of the big manufacturers are siding with, are siding with Dolby. They're going with Dolby Vision, LG... Um, I think Panasonic also does Dolby Vision, and Sony, I believe, does does Dolby yeah. Vision. So, and but then you have your manufacturer. biggest TV manufacturer in the world with Samsung yeah. saying, "Yeah, we're we're not paying for that." <laughs> so you guys get HDR, <laughs> and that's yeah. the problem. Is again, it's it's up to the manufacturers to choose whether they will or they won't, and it tends to fall in line with the biggest manufacturers of TVs, or you know, this goes to any electronics product it's yes samsung i only buy samsung tvs i would question that next time because i do want the absolute best i would love dolby vision just because i I want to be able to experience the best that there is and uh and i'm willing to pay for it not for not for nothing but samsung helped develop the hdr 10 plus process which is why they don't want to start (laughs) it was cheaper yeah, it's cheaper. For yeah, it, it, it's cheaper for them to d- develop their entirely own, their own process rather than to, to license out Dolby Vision. <laughs> so, so this this Dolby Vision. What is the difference between Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos? And Brandon, perhaps you can explain to us what Dolby Atmos is and why it's important. Well, I'll I'll absolutely give you the 
the layman's terms on it, and I know uh, I think Gray just got his Dolby Atmos system set up, so I, he's going to probably <laughs> hop into the into that. So Dolby Atmos is is object based audio. It's uh, the, again the basic term is more speakers in in more places, leading to a more more clear surround experience. So generally now with Dolby Atmos, you're going to have four speakers on the ceiling or four upward firing speakers, uh, as well as your standard 5.1 setup. And that allows for, for the, the creators of these films and, and shows to really put sounds in places that you normally don't get. So it's not just, you know, you've got your music and your effects in this channel. It's, you can, you can put one single effect and one single speaker without the music, uh, to be able to cause whatever effect that you want. So if you want just a helicopter flying over the upward firing left speakers, you can do just that. And it, it really just leads, lends itself into a more dynamic experience, a more immersive experience. And it's for me, like I have a, a Samsung Dolby Atmos soundbar with rear speakers. It's all upward firing. Uh, and I have a low ceiling for okay. something like man of steel. There's, there's one shot in the opening Krypton scene where jor climbs out of the codex chamber yeah. And you hear the, the Kryptonians saying jor by by the authority of General Zod. <laughs> and it's just it's, – it only comes out of my rear left high speaker. And it just sounds so amazing that it's coming from behind me like I'm jor sitting there listening to it. It's <laughs> – it really is when I mean when you hear the dynamics of it actually happen, even over just five point one, which is awesome. It's it really is kind of something when you hear it all come to life. So is Dolby Atmos a um, an element of a film, or is it something that you? So would you have would you experience Dolby Atmos with um, particular technology, or is it? part of the the film itself uh, so yeah. both you it's yeah. most movies now yeah their their movies are designed with way more than seven speakers their movie theaters are what 20 speakers and 10 subwoofers i mean there there's far more yeah dolby atmos can support like 90 yes yeah. speakers. yeah it can <laughs> scale all the way up or all the way down <laughs> the way that you used to think about sound was they used to talk about sound in terms of channels Right. Mm -hmm. So, so mono was one channel. Yeah. Stereo was two channels. So now you have two independent speakers. Mm -hmm. You can send specific sounds to one speaker, specific sounds to another. Yeah. We moved up to the. I'm going to skip over a whole bunch of stuff. When we moved up to Dolby Digital, Dolby Digital became a five speaker system. So you have right. five individual channels. You say we can send channel to the, send sound to the speaker channel, or to we can send you know, um, um, Jorel's voice to the left back channel. But it was all a matter of it was individual channels. When Brandon talked about um, this Dolby Atmos being object based, this is a completely new method for mixing audio. We're no mm. longer talking about channels it's not about channels anymore so we're no longer worried about are we addressing five channels are we addressing seven channels now the mixing environment for dolby atmos is basically think about an individual sound as a ball and yeah. the mixing environment is a big box and what you're doing as the mixing engineer is you're taking that ball and you're deciding i want to put that ball in a specific place in this box I'm going to put it in the upper left corner of the box, and I'm going to move it from the upper left corner of the box to the back right corner of the box. Hmm. That's your sound mix. The Dolby Atmos system looks at the number of speakers that it has available to it. So it's no longer looking at just the number of channels. It's saying, I've got this many speakers, and they are in this configuration. You know, I've got 10 speakers stretched across the ceiling, and I've got 15 speakers all around. So now I know as that ball is being moved across that virtual box, I know where to put that sound so it travels. Okay, the so speakers. so all of these calculations are done by the television itself, right? It's, it's all part of the audio mix. So it's, encode, it's encoded into 
whatever information the, that you're the being sound designer is yeah yes. either across the stream or from the from the disc or whatever and either your television or your audio receiver or whatever it's taking this this digital stream of information that's been mm-hmm. coded with all this information and it decodes it all and sends the sound to the appropriate speakers so if i was to um wander into a store and try and improve my my sound system um maybe i would consider something like a, a 5.1 surround sound our uh, sound bar what are the kind of differences between the kind of physical technologies that people might want to buy or investigate well, to improve their sound systems literally anything is better than your tv speakers yes. <laughs> uh, so what people will whine about a sound bar not being good enough a sound bar is better than what you what you're hearing out of your tv and you will notice a difference mm-hmm. and it will sound a lot better yeah, but you need a you need a bare minimum a two point one. It needs to have a subwoofer. You have to have a subwoofer. Don't let anybody tell you you don't need a subwoofer. You need a subwoofer. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. It, it it changes everything. And then the, just the more the more you want out of the movie, the more immersive you want to be, the more speakers you add. So yeah, five point mm-hmm. one is relatively inexpensive for something that's very good, and it's going to give you a more uh, surround experience and it's going to be nicer and then as you move up you can spend a lot of money and you can add like i mean like we said with dolby atmos you can add 20 30 40 speakers if you wanted to and just blow people away just depending on how how bad you want it and how much money you truly have <laughs> when we when we talk about surround sound let's let's go ahead and lay out what we mean at this point surround sound is pretty much defined by three specific speakers that's the center speaker and the two speakers that either go in the side or the back everybody's used to stereo that's two speakers Two speakers is not going to give you surround sound. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what they do or what what kind of digital trickery that they do. Two speakers cannot give you surround sound because you do not actually have sound coming from different directions. The Mm -hmm. word that we want to talk about or the word that we want to use when we talk about surround sound is discrete. Discrete individual speakers. So you have to have a, a dedicated center speaker two dedicated speakers in the front left and right and at least two speakers in the back or on either side in order for something to be surround sound so with those minimum channels we can start to address where the source of the sound is coming from a sound bar is typically a really compact device that that serves a couple of different functions. It's usually got a couple speakers in it, plus uh, an amplifier in order to run those speakers, in order to power those speakers. Usually has an onboard decoder also, um, which means it's going to take the digitally encoded signal that comes in, decode it, break it down, and send the audio to the appropriate channels. And it's got to do this in a very... Um, compact space. Um, a lot of them don't get up to be very loud. They can. I've seen some some subwoofers that say, or some subwoofers, some sound bars that say that they get up to like you know 500 watts or 600 watts or, or something like that of power. I don't know how how good they sound. They're usually pretty expensive. We're mm-hmm. talking up the up in the thousands of dollars. Um, a more powerful. I don't or more capable surround sound system will usually start with a receiver, which is a device that you plug all of your shit into. All your speakers plug into it. All of your PS5 and your TV and your Blu-ray player, everything plugs in there. And it's kind of like the switchboard, the old switchboards that they used to use on the telephones. So like You're- a go-between between your television or your DVD player to exactly. your sound system. Exactly. Like an, also, old, like an old amplifier, for example. Yep, and exactly. And in there, you're going to have um, an amplifier system that's going to do you know, the job. But you're going to end up with a more powerful system. And more importantly, you're going to end up with a system that is going to be able to manage all of your discrete 
speakers. So you're mm -hmm. going to have individual speaker wires that are going to run from this thing out to all the speakers all around the room. Sound bars now can have some um, – a lot of them are, are coming with wireless surround speakers, you know, uh, to go on the sides. In the sound bar, you'll have your left and your right and your center speaker. They'll have uh, a subwoofer that may also be wireless. Mm -hmm. You know, so you can get kind of the experience, but really the purpose of a sound bar system is more of what they call a lifestyle device. Right. It's to get you close to the experience in a way that you don't have to spend a lot of time configuring a, you know, a, configuring a room and it doesn't take up a whole lot of space and it isn't really noticeable. If you're going to go with a real more elaborate surround sound system, it's going to take a lot more space and it's going to be a lot more obtrusive. So it's kind of with, a trade off that you make. With respect to wireless, um, I, I'm I'm assuming there's going to be some kind of a lag as well um, with, the, with the data going through the air. It's not as fast as going through cable. There's a, there's a lot of ways that they can compensate for lag. So you'll, so you'll never – if even if there is any lag, you probably won't really notice, won't notice it. the nature of the sounds. Um, the big compromise, though, is in – sound quality um, mm. which is something that they're they're working on and some of them have gotten better but with regular speakers and wires you're sending an analog signal even if yeah. the the sound starts as a digital source like on a blu-ray disc or something like that it's going to be decoded and changed into an analog signal so you're actually going to have um a, you know an electronic charge that's going to be sent across mm -hmm. the wire to the speaker and that's what's going to drive it. Uh -huh. If you're going wireless, um, most wireless systems for speakers don't use a full band, uh, a full bandwidth or full resolution signal. So if you've got a, a movie where the audio has been encoded at 24 bits and at 96 kilohertz or 48 kilohertz, you know, depending on what you're doing, um, this, the soundbar can take that and it can it can decode that. But in order to get that audio to the wireless speakers in the bandwidth that's available for it and at the, the power that's available to transmit it, it's got to start chopping away at the resolution. So you're going for 24, 96 usually down to which is considered like a full full high res quality full or, or studio quality or master quality you're taking that signal and then you're you're chopping the resolution down to usually cd quality which is like 16 16 bit at 44 kilohertz so you're losing some resolution. are you going to notice it probably not mm -hmm. most people most people will never notice the difference but but it is happening, and that's the again. That's kind of the trade-off that you make for these lifestyle devices that are usually much smaller and much more compact and easier to hide. Yeah, and obviously, uh, the the more premium the technology, the better it is at doing all of these things. But anytime you meet an early adopter, they know that the they you pay for it. If if you want the best up front, you pay for it, and eventually it will get cheaper, and it will end up in in the sh the stuff you see on Walmart shelves. But it it takes a while. Yeah. It takes a long time to perfect yep. that technology. And somebody like me, and it sounds like somebody like Gray, we're okay paying that premium. I want it. I need it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my, I have a Samsung soundbar. Mine was $1,500. So, I mean, it's, it's not something you just go to the store and pick up. It was, it was really heavy. Mm -hmm. And it does a, a fantastic job. Is it as good as a, as a full discrete? powered by a, a standalone amplifier no i know that uh but at the time i had just moved out here and i wanted you know a taste of of the greatness and it's awesome <laughs> it really is and eventually i know when i actually build my my standalone theater in my basement i will i will absolutely be hardwiring in i will go through everything to make sure that it's I'll, I'll make sure I get the best. And it doesn't have to be that expensive. Yeah. It's just time consuming. You have to buy all the elements. You have to run wires. There is a best way to do it. But most people just don't know or don't care. 
and most people just won't notice. I mean, it, almost every girl I've ever dated, they, you show them a 4K TV, and they're like, I don't see the difference. It's like, are you, yeah. what are you, nuts? Yeah. Like, <laughs> try opening your eyes. <laughs> and that's the thing is, nine out of ten people are like, yeah, that's cool, whatever. Yeah, but yeah. but for somebody know, like me, I'm like, no, this is nuts. They won't notice the resolution, but they always notice the color. That's they, the they one thing I've yeah. noticed about them. They always notice the color. Brandon touched on something interesting um, or in, in, that's important to understand when we're talking about um, surround audio, and especially the difference between sound bars and a, a fuller home theater system. A lot of sound bars will advertise themselves as full surround sound in a single package. You know, it'll be a five channel system or even a Dolby Atmos um, system in mm-hmm. one in one bar. You kind of go, oh, that's that's crazy. You know, everybody else has all these speakers and they're hanging speakers from the ceiling. And they got speakers all around the room and everything. And this is all one thing that'll do the that'll do the job. This has got to be some awesome technology. Well, again, there's a lot of trickery that goes on. We deal with uh, something called uh, psychoacoustics, which is basically the study of how the human ear and how the human brain perceives sound, not just mm-hmm. how it hears it, but how it processes it. With a regular home theater system, when we're talking about discrete speakers. Again, it means you have a speaker for each place you want the sound to come from. Uh, Brandon said earlier that, that I just installed a, a Adobe Atmos system. Well, in order to be able to do that, I had to, in addition to the seven speakers that I have all around my listening area, I had to mount speakers, in my case, up high on the front wall. And right. in order to get Dolby Atmos, I had to physically install new speakers. But that means when an Atmos signal is being decoded, I have individual sounds coming out of those speakers that aren't coming from any place else mm-hmm. that are being projected directly to me with no obstructions. I am getting the full sound from those speakers a lot of what they call add-on modules for dolby atmos and a lot of what sound bars that claim to do atmos and some surround systems do is they will have individual speakers for those things but since they're all in that bar they're not all going to be pointing at you from different directions you obviously can't get surround sound from the side from speakers Mm -hmm that are in front of you. It doesn't work that way. So what they're doing is they are specifically tuning the sound that's coming out of those Atmos enabled speakers or those side speakers, surround speakers, and they're firing those sound waves at the walls and bouncing them back at you. (laughs) So you're getting sound coming from the side of you, but you're not getting it directly from the speakers. And what this is doing is this is... It's introducing distortion yeah. into, the, into the sound. It's it's dispersing the sound so it's so it's not as pure and it's not as clean. Yeah, it sounds like it's all coming from around you, but there's no distinctiveness to it. It's not literally coming from somewhere. I mean, it's the basic concept is that the the cheaper or easier you want technology to be, the more sacrifices you make. It's just like it was with the the visuals. Yep. If you're willing to make some sacrifices, they they do a pretty good job of mimicking it. Mm-hmm. Like like he said, mine isn't going to be as discreet as a speaker firing directly at me because mine has speakers that point up. So it does have its own speakers, but to deliver that to me, it has to know that it's got to go off the ceiling. And then that's what I'm hearing is what is hitting the ceiling, not as what is coming from the ceiling. Right. Uh, so it is a sacrifice, but it's a sacrifice to get it in a cheaper system. Uh, and the more sacrifices you are willing to make, the lower the price ends up being, and the the easier it is to unplug, uh, unbox it, plug it in, plug one wire in, and say, "Hey, I have surround sound." Yeah, the so, everything is is better when you take the time and the effort to put something in. Most people just don't need that or don't need not care, but the ones that or, do, there is definitely a but, reward for it. And there is a cost, though. There is a Yeah, for cost difference. Yeah, but what I'm getting is that for someone who is um, perhaps not as uh, financially comfortable or able to invest 
large amounts of money into these systems. There are um, there are alternatives that oh, can absolutely. do a pretty decent job. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Buy a hundred and fifty dollar soundbar, you mm-hmm. will be happy with it. Excellent. Uh, everything starts. I mean, your first car isn't a Ferrari. Your right. first car is I don't know what a uh, Mini Cooper or whatever you guys drive over there. <laughs> Uh, here yeah you get you get your your brown old beat up ford tempo that's your first car is it better than walking you bet your ass it is yeah Yeah. but everything in time you you start at the bottom if you just want something that sounds nicer than the tv that's Mm -hmm. anything so yeah 150 bucks is i personally is a worthy investment for something that sounds a little bit better yeah i mean and then eventually Go ahead. I would uh, I would always say though you know just my personal recommendation to anyone if you don't have a good environment for some of these you know bouncing bouncing sound systems if you've got bookshelves all over the place or you've got one side of the room that's like big open and everything like that cathedral there's ceilings nothing, yeah. There's nothing wrong with just investing in a solid two-channel system. It's well, going to sound way better. Than, oh. Yeah, it's going to sound way better than your TV. You get a subwoofer to go along with it, and the subwoofer basically is, you know, it covers any frequency below 120 hertz. That's like 120 hertz down to you know five or something like that and that's what i wanted to get to really is that in this day and age almost everybody is able to get some kind of home theater experience which years ago it was really not possible you Mm -hmm. can you can get an affordable sound system an affordable television it can sound and look amazing um we've covered the basics let's cover some kind of uh, luxuries let's say okay all right so now you're speaking my language <laughs> so so brandon i know f- that you have a curved television so s- there was this thing in the 50s and 60s called cinemascope where people um went to the cinema and instead of watching bog standard film on a on a bog standard screen you got this huge enormous curved screen that went almost around the whole theater and it used multiple projectors to project their image onto this enormous screen and because it was curved i was wondering is was there some kind of intention of um, mimicking that kind of experience or or did they do it for a different reason tell us it all was... about your sleek curved tv <laughs> brandon <laughs> uh so yeah i mean there will be a, a couple of different parts on this is uh, traditionally movie theater screens are curved because they take a projection image and the wider you make that image the more distortion you get in on the sides uh, Mm -hmm. because it has to stretch it further so when you curve the screen just a little bit it's not a drastic curve the image on the sides does not have to project as far so it allows for for less of the stretching less distortion yeah Uh, obviously when you have a panel and you're not projecting anything that isn't really the thing that's that that's not how that works um but as you do look on a on an lcd screen no matter what lcd screen there is a certain point where you stop being able to really make out the image it's your viewing angle Mm -hmm. uh so one that curve kind of gives you the idea that you're looking at a movie theater screen it's kind of cool um It does allow for a little bit better viewing angle because it curves that image in just ever so slightly to where the people on the edges of your couch aren't losing any color. They're not losing any any clarity because they're on the edge of that image looking at at it from an angle uh, instead of dead center. Uh, But ultimately, I like many things. I I, I like it. It was it was a gimmick that there's. There's no if, ifs, ands, or buts about it. It didn't really solve much of a problem that anybody actually had. It was just something for Samsung to say, hey, look what we've got. Yeah. And did it work? Yeah. Would I buy it again? I don't know. I'd probably spend the extra money from the curve just on, a, on the next model up because mm-hmm. uh, that was kind of the decision for me. Mine's a 9000 series uh, that I got right when 4Ks really kind of came out. 
Um, and I could have gone one level up on a flat panel and it realistically, I probably should have, cause it would have taken me from edge lighting to rear backlit lighting, uh, mm-hmm. which is more important for your deeper blacks and your brighter whites. But I kind of wanted the curve. Uh, and is it cool when people come over and say, you've got one of those curve TVs? And you're like, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of cool, but it's not necessary. Don't go out and say, hey, I have to have a curved TV. It doesn't really achieve much other than just kind of looking cool. Gray, you had one as well, didn't you? I did have, I think I had the, probably the same uh, model series that Brandon has. Um, and it was, again, it was it was an interesting idea. I had the, the option of getting the flat or getting the curved. And I got the curved because, I, I mean, honestly, I thought it I thought it'd be cool. It looked uh, kind of cool. <laughs> it, it, look, it, look kinda, it does. It, it looks kind of cool. It, it's, a, it's a nice little piece of display engineering. Um, do I think that I saw a real benefit from getting it? Not really, because there are other things in that particular screen that are more important to worry about. Like um, Brandon was talking about uh, the different types of backlighting. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're really starting to get into really starting to kind of touch into the difference between LCD and, and OLED with those. Um, so it's the, the whole curve screen thing is a it's a neat looking idea, um, but whether or not it's really important, I don't think it is, but it does look cool. So you just touched on OLED and LED and LCD and QLED. <laughs> what? <laughs> WXYZ and a partridge what? pear tree. <laughs> what are the differences between those? We're talking about the types of panels when we say panel, we're talking about the actual devices or pieces of the TV that actually make the image. Mm-hmm. Um, and LCD LCD stands stands for liquid crystal display. So you have this this panel that's basically a sheet of these little crystals in a liquid suspension. Yeah, spread all spread all across it and everything. And and um, behind that, you're going to have a backlight, and there's going to be other polarizers and sheets of glass and things like that. But basically, an LCD screen TV or, or any sort of LCD screen is a LCD liquid crystal panel with a light behind it. Okay. Without the light, you can't see what's the, the, the image can, can render, but without the light, you can't see what you the image You won't be able to see it. You you could, to see. So, so if your backlight goes off, for example, and you were to hold a torch behind it, you'd see the, you'd see the image. You could see it depending on how bright yeah. Depending on how bright the torch was, the and OLED is, OLED yeah. is is a different, completely different animal. OLED stands for organic light emitting diode. Um, an OLED is a sheet of organic elements that, when you apply electricity to it, lights up on its own. Right, so here's the difference between the LCD and the LED is that each individual LED produces its own light, whereas right. the LCD, it produces its own image, but the light comes from a separate source. Exactly, and right. this this affects your image quality in a very, very important way. With an OLED... When you get to the point where an image, the p- a piece of an image is black, the mm-hmm. OLED just stops sending a charge to it. That particular pixel just turns off. Right. So that means it is a true black. And black is the foundation of all the colors that you're going to see. It's, it's the starting point for everything. So the deeper, darker, and truer your black is, mm-hmm. the more accurate and richer your colors are going to be. Well, it makes sense to me because black is the absence of light. Exactly. So if LED is off, that means you are getting a genuine absence of light. Whereas I presume, and correct me if I'm wrong, on an LCD, if you have a black sector, let's say part of your screen is black, the backlight doesn't turn off in that 
area of the screen, correct? It depends. See, this is where you start to get into different compromises. Right, okay. In, in, in older LCD screens, you would have your lighting element behind the screen, either fluorescent light or an LED light as it, as it became uh, later on, and that would be exactly correct. Even if the panel stopped generating image, if there was a section of the image that was black, you would still have the backlight behind it. The backlight is still shining through the screen. So that portion of the screen is never actually going to be true black. It can be a very dark gray, Mm-hmm. It will never actually be black because there will always be some light coming through it. Yeah, that's so why when, when you look at the black bars, the letterbox, when you're watching a film, mm-hmm. sometimes you can you can see like it's a it's not quite black. It's different from if you're watching it at night, for example, or in a dark room, you can still see some light coming through those black bars, yep. right? Yep, exactly. Yeah, you can see some cloudiness in it, and mm-hmm. you can see actually where the clusters of LEDs are. So because, what, yeah, it kind of creates a small cloud. Yeah. So what TV manufacturers started doing in order to kind of mitigate that issue is they started um, creating what they called uh, lighting zones. So instead of having one big bar light behind the, the uh, LCD panel, for example, what they started doing is they started installing – clusters mm. of LEDs behind it. You know, you would have, you know, 20 lighting zones or 10 lighting zones or something like that. And what this allowed them to do was examine the picture information that was coming in and as pieces of the image or areas of the image got darker, they could dim the different LED zones or turn them off individually. So, for example, in a black bar, in the letterbox, the television would calculate that this area is completely black. Yep. Perhaps turn turn it off or dim the backlight in that area. Now, tell me about QLED. How is QLED different from OLED? QLED is different from OLED because QLED is still an LCD technology. Uh, uh, what QLED does is it adds in it adds an extra layer of color element that allows them to kind of filter the light and break down the colors into smaller, more distinct segments in order to be able to mix them differently. Mm-hmm. But still, it, it QLED or, or Q, QLED and WQLED and whatever it is, they're all still LCD-based technologies. You're still right. basically going LCD panel and then there's a light behind it. Okay. And that's right. never, that's, that's never going to change. Right, it's so. about pretty much the peak of where you can go with with LCD technology. It's yep. it's as close as you're going to get to OLED before mm-hmm. they just eventually have to go to OLED or micro LED, which is the new thing. Or micro, yeah. So, in a word, OLED is the best technology. At this point, the only thing that stops OLED from being the thing that just peels everybody's eyelids back is the fact that OLEDs are limited in how bright they can be because Uh they create their, because the pixels create create their their own light. light. Exactly. Um, They have to be limited in order to try to maintain the lifespan Mm -hmm. of those, of those pixels. So they're only ever, I think the brightest OLED, if, if let's say a 1000 nits is kind of your, you know, that's your baseline goal for HDR is you want to say at least we want to be able to hit, you know, a thousand nits. I think the brightest OLED screens get to maybe about 900 at their okay. absolute brightest. Mm-hmm. They don't quite get there where well, you can have an LCD TV that can get over a thousand, over a thousand nits and be, and be really, really bright. But it's again, it's all that kind of trade off, though, because the mm-hmm. brighter your LCD screen, even if you have a whole lot of different lighting zones, you're always going to have light that's going to leak around on the inside of the screen. You're never going to get an area of an LCD screen that's ever going to be completely 100 percent black because you're always going to get light from some other portion of the screen that's going to leak through it. That's so always going to happen. So if blacks are more important for you, you want to go for OLED, but if your um, brighter colors and your whites are more important to you, let's say mm-hmm. you're in a lit, in, in a brightly lit environment, you'd mm-hmm. probably want to go for a, a, a QLED or a LED. Exactly. Right. So exactly. If, I'm, if I'm watching films at night, mostly I would go for a, I would go for an OLED. 
or if you had a, if you had a, a dedicated home theater room mm-hmm. where you could really you could really manage the light level in there, I would say mm-hmm. go with an OLED. Uh, so last thing to mention on, on OLED is just going to be the thickness of the TV. Since it does not have to have a lighting system, the panels can be impossibly thin. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, the, there's literally TVs called wallpaper TVs that you can <laughs> get out and magnetically snap to the wall. Wow. Uh, all the processors are handled separately so like the wallpaper tv from uh lg has its own dolby atmos soundbar that does all the video processing and there's one small wire that runs to the entire tv <laughs> that's amazing uh, but you literally take it out and you magnetically snap it to the to the wall and it <laughs> it looks like a window it's it's stupid thin they've actually got one better than that now too cuz they've actually Stop it. i I don't, I'll buy it. <laughs> Stop it! I'll buy it. Oh my god! They've goodness. got they've, they've they've got they've got one better now. I don't know if it's on if it's on mark yet, but now they actually have they have an uh, LG has an OLED TV that basically it looks like it starts off looking like just like a wooden a wooden box, and they actually have an OLED panel that rolls out from inside it and extends just extends upward, at you know. You just basically hit a button on a remote control and you you set up this thing like you're like you're popping up a popping up a projection screen, but it's an OLED screen. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. I've it's got all the sound and everything inside it. And and the cool thing is, you can actually you can stop it, or it, it can be the extension can be managed at different sizes. It's a sixteen by nine panel on the inside, but you can like bring it up just like you know. A third of the way, so it basically just looks like a ticker bar. So if you're just playing music or something like that, it just has a little <laughs> player thing down oh there, and, you can ex- and then you can extend it up a little bit further. Um, so if you're watching a movie, let's say that's in 235 widescreen, instead of having to have you know extend it all the way up to 16 by nine, and then having the image letterboxed, you can extend it up just high enough to where the proportion of the visible <laughs> image is 235. <laughs> have no letterboxing around it that's ridiculous yeah that's cool uh, it's also ridiculous. like eighteen thousand yeah. dollars <laughs> so i've said for a while brandon's that, brandon's making getting his house mortgaged. Yeah, i'm on i'm on best buy right now like send it to me i i, I need more debt uh but i've said for a while that probably in the next 10 years when you go to best buy or or wherever to buy your TV, you'll buy it in a poster tube, and you'll just unroll it and stick unroll it to the wall. <laughs> we, our phones have wireless electricity. TVs require so little electricity now, and the yeah. the better technology gets. I mean, my well, 4K TV is like $17 a year. We, we're also going to be transitioning away from, um, from silicon now to graphene. Which yep. is minuscule, so yep. that's that's going to make everything thinner and smaller than we could even possibly imagine. Um, to a point where they're going to be able to paint, they're going to be able to paint images, basically yeah. paint OLEDs, the no, OLED organic pixels onto a wall, and you just apply a charge to it. And yeah. There's your fucking. There's your screen. <laughs> it's ridiculous when you think about it. Where where we are and where where we. Where we already are, really, and where we're going to be in the future. So, Brandon, one more little uh, luxury that we'd like to tell people about is you recently um, added some really cool lighting to your your, uh, home theater setup. I remember a friend of mine had this kind of uh, lighting behind his old Philips uh, 720p television, which used to, you know, used to turn it on blue and it would stay on blue all through the <laughs> all the time that it was on or if it was red he'd manually change it to you know one of four colors and whatever i think yours is a little bit more advanced it's, than that. <laughs> it's gone a little bit more advanced <laughs> uh, tell us about it so i have my whole house is philips hue which mm-hmm. is a smart light bulb system every light is an led light bulb uh, that is connected over Wi-Fi to a little control unit. So I can literally tell my Google system to turn on the light in the shower or the light in the living room, <laughs> and each light bulb comes on and off however I want to. Uh, it's great across the whole house, but 
I've been adding lights around and behind the TV for a while now, um, partially because they say it's better for for your eyes to have a, a backlighting behind the TV mm-hmm. that separates the wall from the LED panel that your eyes focus better. Yeah. Um, it's really cool to have kind of that mood. So when I say watch a movie, the lights dim down up above and then all the colored lights turn blue and I can watch a movie. But then recently I bought what's called a Hue Play sync system. Okay. And what it does is it's a little control box that goes between my my TV's HDMI port and the HDMI port coming out of my sound bar, which mm-hmm. all my other electronics are plugged into. And essentially it's reading the image before it sends it to the TV and converting it to light. And I have currently, I have four zones. I have two light bars on the sides and two LED strips on top. Mm -hmm. And it can convert what is happening on the the edges of the picture into color spectrum. So if the screen goes red, the lights go red. Uh, But it's not just one color. It can do it in four separate zones right now. And I can do up to 10 separate zones um at the same time which is wow. really cool because for things like lightning uh w- the white will flash on the screen really quickly to mm-hmm. give you that that thought of lightning but the lights in the room will also flash at the same time wow um and so if you've got like a, a a color of let's say green in the top right hand corner of the screen like it might be a tree for example and then in the bottom left your it's more um, an absence of light. It's like dark or a, a It will turn screen. one off and keep the other one on. And right. So it, it will change based kind of on the ex- picture. So it's kind of expanding the experience around the screen. I thought it was going to be cool when I bought it. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of cool as I was as I was setting it up and as I was playing with it. But then I put on Batman versus Superman. Yeah. And the first image I went to was the the fight between Batman and Superman and it's black and you're getting a lot of lightning. You're getting a lot of ambient light from the city. Mm -hmm. So you're getting little bits here and there, but the lightning flashes were really cool. And then Superman catches the grenade and it explodes green. And my entire wall went green (laughs) behind it. And I have not been so hard watching a movie in a long time. That was at that moment. I knew that, the movie had had almost jumped out off of the screen. Like 4K is awesome, yeah. HDR is awesome, but I, I I knew it that I was watching that movie. But this felt like you were like there. the explosion was in the room, and yeah. the green faded up above. And then when it would switch back to the to Batman talking, and there was no green, it mm-hmm. would it, the green would go away, and then it would fade back to to the green and Superman you know, struggling and it's, it's all back. So it's a fully immersive experience, really fully immersive. I, I, it's almost like watching every movie again Mm -hmm. because it's so cool. I was watching dark Phoenix and the way the Phoenix force is moving around Jane and Jean as she's absorbing it is this, the wall is moving. You can almost see it. Like the wall is alive. Like the Phoenix force is in the room being sucked into the image on the tv that's awesome holy shit is it so cool it's not perfect it you don't want to watch it on a comedy or a drama or something where (laughs) we're bringing that world to life doesn't matter because like whites when it when it's going from like inside to outside it's trying to resolve different shades of white and it's not all that great but for action scenes uh i put in pacific rim and it was absolutely insane uh, the new Godzilla was absolutely insane. And then even video games, I started playing Control, and you're in this office lighting, and it's almost putting like a yellow fluorescent on the wall, and then you walk into this, what, what's essentially a haunted area, mm-hmm. and it's bright red, and as you're moving into it, the colors around the TV start turning to red to almost make you feel like you yourself are walking into that area and it actually adds a little bit of anxiety to it because it's not again it's not just happening on on the tv now now it's happening in that room and it's it's pretty cool awesome and sounds Uh, really sounds really really cool like a real immersive film experience great you got any experience with with uh this kind of lighting I looked at it uh, for mm-hmm. a while. I 
am kind of a person. I, I'm I'm a little bit more of a purist. I think when it comes to that, I I don't like the I or didn't like the idea of anything that might distract from distract from watching this watching mm-hmm. the image on the screen. Um, I've tried things like uh, you know everybody's tried 3D. You know, mm-hmm. I really dig 3D. I, I I've done the the D box motion seating a couple of times, which is gimmicky and and kind of cool, but doesn't really add anything to the experience. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not completely on board with this with this um, lighting thing, but I have seen the videos that Brandon put up, and it is it is impressively cool. Um, <laughs> I, I I don't I don't know I don't know how much I would really want to use it though you know to be Brandon how, perfectly honest Brandon how would you compare it as um as a new technology for someone for example who's experienced uh, 3D for the first time because I think we we've all been through that uh, experience with um, Avatar for example the first time we saw 3D it felt like cinema had changed how do you how do you see um this technology as a as a as an addition is it a welcome addition is it uh, more a gimmick or do you think that it will be a mainstay in your home personally at this point it, I, i'm still in the honeymoon phase on it <laughs> i kind of want this going forward i think that this some tv manufacturer needs to install uh, 20 LEDs on the back panel and put the onboard processing into it to where the, you just say we have you know the color projection we have active cinema or hey, whatever pat- you want to pat- call it pat- 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 <laughs> somebody call it uh, somebody call Samsung I'm selling it to him but realistically you know 9 out of 10 technologies that come in TVs is some kind of gimmick it's something to say we've kind of run out of ideas we're push, pushing things here that's in cell phones that's anything with technology yeah. and so but stick, I think right? there is a point where right now it's too expensive for all the lights and the systems and everything that that you have to buy you're spending more than the TV it's about 600 bucks to do this by itself mm-hmm. it wasn't that expensive for me because I've added it over time to a system that I already had mm-hmm. um, so it ended up just being 200 bucks for the control box and I was ready to go mm-hmm. um, but if it was a hundred dollar add-on for your new TV if you could just buy your TV and it was in it and it did all the processing for you and it had again I mean if you had just 20 LEDs on the back or uh, or 100 LEDs that's going to by a manufacturing standpoint that's three dollars to add to the tv yeah and it's a it's something that gives something new i would love to see a a tv manufacturer put this on there and let people decide if they want to turn it on and off it's better than auto motion plus that stuff is terrible and it's still around um you know if somebody like gray says you know what this is kind of distracting cool turn it off but he saw just in the in the one video hey this could be kind of cool uh that doomsday fight was absolutely a different experience watching it when you see it in person it's even better but like i was surprised how many people are like i need this like now uh, and it's it's not a, a cost of you can get it right now. You can put lights behind your TV for five bucks, but you have a remote control and you can switch between four colors. Hmm. But if this is, personally, this is yeah, this is this is much different, much more interactive. It's much, much, much more immersive. And if 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 somebody really wants just that extra level of immersion, I say go for it. Um, I've been to a Cinema X theater that has three screens and i found that to be distracting you keep you keep looking left and right trying to figure out what's going on on the side screens if there's really nothing there but it was distracting this is just immersion you know when when heat vision is being used or again lightning something like that it's just 
is bringing that light onto the wall. It's not actually doing an image. It's only expanding the picture and making it feel larger than life almost. So it's not as distracting as you would think it would be. It's just it really almost world changing on on watching an action movie or a comic book movie. I'm going to watch probably Scott Pilgrim versus the world on it and <laughs> probably lose my mind. Nice. Uh, well, guys, um, I promised you all two experts and I think everyone can agree we've got some really, really good information here. Um, I hope that we've been able to help educate some people. I'm sure people will use this information to make their own choices in terms of their televisions, their sound systems, lighting systems, whether they want a curved television or a flat one. We've given them so much information here. And I just want to thank you guys for your expertise and sharing it with everyone. Gray, why won't you tell the good people where they can find you and maybe uh, annoy you with questions on what television to buy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can hit me on Twitter at only underscore gray. Um, you can read my blog. I, I've been kind of expanding things, but I mostly cover a lot of uh, movie issues, quote unquote, reviews and analysis and things like that. And you can find that at not the popular opinion dot wordpress dot com. Excellent. Definitely check that out. There's some really excellent articles there. And also, thank you very much, Brandon, for joining us. You are a film exile. People can find you on the film exiles doing podcasts like this. Your Watchmen series was excellent. Why don't you tell the good people where they can find you and talk film? Uh, so I'm on Twitter at the underscore meatball underscore 84. Pretty easy to find. Find Love having good, honest discussions. So bring it on. Great, guys. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for joining us in the spotlight, looking at the home theater experience. I'm really glad we got all of this excellent information out to the people. And until next time, stay exiled.